Um, I'm uh, Luke Hospiter. I'm here to give a talk about a data processing system we built called Data Shuffler. Um, I think it's very excellent, so I want to try to talk about the design choices we made and um, how we use Clojure in that. So uh, about me and my company, um, I work for Ithaca. Um, it's the parent company of ArtStore, Ithaca SR, JSTOR, Portico. Um, JSTOR is the, the kind of the biggest thing under this umbrella. Um, we are a nonprofit. We have a couple hundred employees, a few dozen development teams, um, a lot of different languages, but a lot of Python, Java, um, front end stuff. Um, so JSTOR specifically, um, our primary business is delivering uh, digitized back file content. We were one of the first people to digitize. So this is journals that are older than about five years old. Um, it used to be that you needed to go deep into a physical library to find a physical copy of this. In the late 90s, they started um, scanning these en masse, uh, putting them online, uh, indexing them so they can be searched. Um, and and our, our mission is to expand access to academic content in general. So we also have um, academic monograph books, uh, large kind of freeform research reports, other things like that. Um, in terms of our uh, magnitude, um, we'll deliver up to over 20 million PDFs on a busy day in November. Um, we, we have a primary log fire hose that, that, that describes all of that activity, a lot of backend activity, a lot of other activity that, that depending on what's going on today, um, we'll have tens or over 100 million events per day. And, and so my team is the data platform team, um, and, and our job is to help the organization make something useful out of that fire hose, primarily for business analytics and other things like that. Um, so what I want to cover today is what is Data Shuffler? What, what's the context that we built it in? Um, what are we trying to solve with this? And, and, and pretty explicitly, what are we not trying to solve? I think the, the, the limitations and, and the problems we decided not to solve are, are just as important or more important than what, what we wanted to solve. Um, and, and, and we'll talk about why we chose closure. I want to talk about spec. I want to talk about polymorphism a little bit. Um, so uh, this is like a kindergarten picture of our data, chef, our data pipeline. I'm sure it will look very familiar to you. There's a bunch of apps. They run on Java or whatever. They produce JSON event data into a Kafka topic. Um, we persist that to Amazon S3. Um, we process this with this legacy ETL system we have. Other people use that for other stuff. Um, the, the part of this that's really important here is, is that we have this single Kafka topic that contains all significant event data across our entire system. Um, and we have very little requirements on what you need to do to participate in this. There are like, you must set five fields. Um, you need to set a timestamp. You need to set an event type. You need to set where it came from. Um, a couple other things, a unique ID. But that's about it. And then you can put whatever else in there that you want. Um, and, and so most of those events are kind of qualified by their type. Um, and, and that's really given us a lot of power to quickly ingest new data into the system and, and apply new processes to that. Um, our, our, the, this, this graph is the number of distinct event types per month since um, late 2016. And, and this is just to demonstrate that um, the complexity of the data that we need to handle is constantly growing. Um, we, we can't have a predefined set of events that is static. Um, it is constantly growing. People are constantly adding new events to this pipeline. Um, so I want to kind of talk just so you have some historical context. Um, our ETL system used to look like, I suspect many people's ETL systems look like, um, we had a bunch of Spark jobs that were written to transform certain kinds of events into certain tables because some business person asked us to make a table. And, and this is stuff like, hey, can you make me a table that shows who downloaded which PDFs every day? Sure, I've got those events. I'll write a Spark job, filter, map, whatever, make a table. Um, we had those jacked into a work, workflow manager. Um, it's, it, the, the whole kind of problem with this is it's very process oriented. It's about like there's a job and it loads some data. And I logically know that, that the purpose of that job is to make a table, but that job could do anything it wants. It could make arbitrary HTTP requests in the middle for fun, and, and maybe those are important, and maybe they're not, and it's unclear. And, um, it's really hard to reason about the system from the ways that people care about. People care about the tables that get made. Um, they care about answering business questions with this analytics data that we produce. They don't really care that a Python job made it. Um, so this was kind of a mess, and it was kind of hard to maintain, and it was pretty brittle. And, and um, 
uh, what, I, what we wanted to do was, was to be able to support this kind of rapid explosion of, of new data coming into the system all the time because the system's constantly changing. Um, we need to be able to create new data sets that describe those things just as fast as we're creating those things. Um, and, and so that's like the organization level goal. And then, you know, my team, our goal is to make that plumbing work right and make it maintainable. And it's not sustainable for us to understand everyone's business need and to be able to comprehend 400 different kinds of events and several hundred different tables that need to be produced. We have like four people on our team. That's just not going to happen. Um, so the, the model that we really want to have is you, we would often describe what's happening. Oh, we build this data set, and then we use that to build this data set. But the, the, the process that actually created those didn't really reflect that. We had a bunch of scripts that like one script made three tables, and another one picked up that table out of a magic file path somewhere and did something else with it. Um, so we always describe these data sets as just like views of other views of other views of the log. And, and what we really wanted was a system that would allow us to actually describe the things formally the same way that we describe them informally. That, that the whiteboard di diagram that I draw is like the same as the diagram that the system actually understands. Um, I, nobody cares too much about the physical location or format of anything. That's sort of important on the edges where like a business person needs to connect Tableau to something, so it needs to be in a database. But beyond, you know, backward from that, nobody really cares. It's just some abstract data. And the only reason that we might actually make a physical copy is for performance reasons. Um, so I want to make those kind of things really easy to deal with and really easy to change and really get that out of people's way. Um, and, and I also don't really care about how the data is constructed at all. Um, I want to describe the table that I want. I don't want to describe how to make that table. Um, so to, to implement this, our goal is we, we want humans to be able to, you know, when I say, well, if you took this table and you did this transformation to it, that, that would be the table that I want. I want them to not have to do a whole lot more than that. Um, and for us, this means, like, I, I can express what I want with a SQL query. I want to just be able to express it with a SQL query. I don't really want to use a whole lot more than that. Um, and and to, to make this effective and successful, um, a really important thing here was to choose the right abstractions that we would handle in the system. And, and so our, our kind of fundamental abstractions are um, a data set, which if you think of like a SQL table, you're thinking about the right thing. Um, but even a little bit more vague than that, um, I, I usually describe this as an arbitrarily ordered collection of structured data. Um, so we don't have primary, like in Spark, we don't have primary keys. Certain SQL tables might have primary keys, but they might not. Um, they might have duplicate rows, they might not. Um, they might come out in an order, they might not, um, but they have, it's like a bag of rows. Um, and, and then we have transforms that do stuff to those and restructure them and, and do kind of classical relational operations on them, join them together, project data out of them, um, do operations on that data. So it seems obvious to me, seemed obvious to me that, that the right way to approach this problem was in a declarative way. Um, Work for Kubernetes, it must be good enough for me. Oh, and SQL 2. Um, so it's all about uh, giving us the power to, to implement that model with, that we really wanted, which was to describe my end goal instead of describing the process that produces my end goal. Um, because then, as, as a system designer, I can implement whatever it takes to reach that end goal. And if I need to completely change that implementation, I don't need to also refactor all of this business logic. So. Um, this is a perfect fit for SQL, which is also declarative. Um, we decided to express all of our actual transformations as SQL because it's not perfect, but pretty much everyone in the world understands it. Um, it's really easy to hire people who know how to do it. It's pretty straightforward for a human to read and, and kind of reason their way through it. Um, and, and it prevents people, I don't want people plugging in random code into a workflow manager again, so I really don't want to give them tools to hurt themselves. I want to give them the ability to transform data in a powerful way, but I don't want to give them the ability to like write infinite loops and make random calls to stuff. Um, so we have a lot of experience using Apache Spark. That's what our old system's based on. It's pretty good at like pushing big blobs of data around. So we decided to go with that. It seemed very practical. Um, it was important that we be able to, that users be able to specify what they want in a declarative way that, that 
is actually correct and executable, that we can give them quick feedback that like this is probably going to do something and work and not just blow up in the middle of the night. Um, we need uh, an, an executor that can actually, because in, in the real world, we actually need to start up clusters and do stuff and move data around and cause side effects. Um, so we needed to be able to implement an, exe an executor for this declarative system that um, would actually work and, and would be extensible so that when, as, as we have new needs and we need to support a new kind of database or something like that, um, that, that we would be able to do that. So, and, and critically, and testing really kind of falls out from this being declarative in the first place, but our old system, the, the actual business logic was very poorly tested, if at all. And I think this is a really common problem with ETL, and I'm gonna talk more about that, but. Um, so, in terms of driving Spark with, sequ with Clojure, um, generally speaking, I have no problem doing that. It's all in the JVM, it works pretty smoothly. Um, there are some, kind of wrappers around Spark, and we use those a little bit, but we really call back to the, directly to the Spark Java APIs directly a lot, and, and that's not particularly problematic for us. Um, so we don't express, as I mentioned, all of our transformations are ex expressed in Spark SQL queries that are stored in a big data structure, and um, so we don't use like the Spark dataset API pretty much at all for anything specific. We do, all of the actual code is all fully generic and is just applying these transforms that come uh, from somewhere else. Uh, so to, to really make this happen, closure spec was really kind of the killer feature that, that let us do this really well um, because we, what we sort of wanted was, was kind of a DSL for a, a, a config file DSL format for expressing this giant stack of transforms, but I didn't really want to write a DSL parser and I didn't really want a DSL, I want a data structure that I can manipulate. Um, so using closure spec is awesome because it, it really let us validate the hell out of this thing and know that it was as correct as we can know before we execute it and, and it's know that people ha don't have missing links and inputs that don't exist and um, stuff like that. So it, it also allowed us to completely uh, sidestep building a UI, building a database system to track this thing um, because even though we have right now like a 10,000 line text file that contains this data structure that we use to drive this thing, and it's just maintained directly by humans in a text editor. And because of the kind of error message we're getting, they're able to do that, and, and we haven't had to like build a big giant system to manage that, and we can just use Git to do version control and rollbacks and branching and development um, just like we would do with any other code, which has been really excellent um, because it, it's allowing us to get these really powerful features quickly without having to build a lot of sugar around it so that people are actually able to use them. Um, I think we're probably kind of abusing spec a little bit. Um, we have crammed in a ton of like super powerful um, validation predicates into spec um, that I think it's not really you know, geared to doing. Like, like this, this data structure represents kind of a, a graph of views that are constructed of other views that are constructed of other views. And one of the things I need to know is like, are there any cycles in this graph? Because that's not gonna work. Um, and so we have like predicated checks for that and, and tries to return expressive error messages. And like some stuff doesn't work great. So um, we don't use spec to conform this data structure. We designed it to look exactly like we want. It's really easy to handle. Um, we've just never, it's never really come up. Um, we also don't use specs built-in generators pretty much at all because um, the, the structure of this is so complex and it depends so much on external data, you can't like generate a random JDBC URL and then expect that to be useful for any kind of testing. Um, so ultimately we do a lot of property-based testing to verify that the low-level components of the system work well, do what they're supposed to do, um, have predictable properties, um, but we don't really take advantage of the spec generators at all. Um, there's some things I don't love about it and I'm really Great, Rich gave his talk yesterday because it felt like it really resonated with me, but um, it, it's a little awkward to write, like I said, to write these really complex validators that kind of go outside the box of just like, this field is required and it's not null. Um, you can stuff any predicate in there and you want, and that's cool, but like we have 300 transformations and they all specify inputs and those inputs are keywords which refer to another transformation 
And so we have a validation um, that checks to make sure that those keywords actually refer to another thing. Um, and if we just put that in a predicate, it would not be very helpful to get an error that says, like, some inputs are wrong. Enjoy, somewhere in this 10,000 line text file, there's one keyword that is, you put a typo in and I don't know where. Um, so, so we ended up writing some macros to help produce better error messages directly. Um, it wasn't ultimately that hard, but I had to like go onto Slack and you know, ask people who know what they're talking about. Um, Phrase uh, library was mentioned the other day, and it's kind of helpful for this, but it didn't exist when I started writing this, so that's too bad. Um, and, and I'm also a little uh, sort of bummed by the lack of portability, um, and I think that part of this is sort of the, 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 the blurred line between structural description and a validation and selection that Rich was talking about yesterday, I think is kind of part of the problem because we have these like, predicate functions that depend on Java libraries that like use Java types and it's very like difficult to effectively ship those over the wire or, or seamlessly execute them in ZLJS or something like that. Um, so that's not really been a big problem for us but it, it has kind of limited in some situations the kind of things that we would do. Um, so this is a um, uh, kind of a diagram of our spec and I, I want to talk about this a lot because for us, a really awesome thing about using spec has been the ability to just kind of endlessly compose specs on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other. Um, so this inside the purple box here, um, we kind of have, we have implemented our own spec for a structural schema description language that we can turn into uh, like SQL create table statements, for example. Um, and we've also implemented our own declarative predicate syntax that's like a SQL where clause to, um, because the big thing we need to do is take this very kind of unstructured fire hose of JSON data and apply structure to it and filter out things that like are probably actually supposed to be there. Um, so those are like several huge other libraries that we wrote that had specs and I was able to just kind of like plop them right inside um, and get useful error messages that, you know, direct the user directly to the location in the larger data structure where the problem exists. Um, that was super helpful and super powerful. And, and, and also the ability that for me to be able to pull out any of these subcomponents and validate them directly, um, we use that constantly to, in test situations, um, in smaller functions that might normally get called in one place and don't really need to validate their input, but occasionally get called from some totally different location, um, and, and they need to just kind of trust but verify. Um, that, that is like a really important and really powerful thing that, that spec allows us to do um, for, for kind of validating the data on the input. Um, it, f to me, I think being able to have this really concise, well-expressed validation has made the actual coding of this so much easier because we don't have to be um, defensive in the procedural code that's actually executing side effects. We don't have to be constantly checking, like, did they actually put a path in there? Is it actually a not empty string? Um, is this table name, like, have weird characters that, are, that aren't going to work? I can safely assume that all those properties are correct because I've already validated all of them on the way in. And, and I have, like, one place where all of those properties are expressed. Um, they're not built into the functions that actually execute side effects, so it's easy for me to validate completely separate from the actual execution. Um, that's been huge in our ability to be successful and get this done quickly. Um, so in, in terms of like how we actually use this, as the slide says, um, when we execute, we, we run this as a big nightly batch process right now. Um, and so we have this gigantic data structure that comes in. And the very first thing we do is validate it. And nothing happens if it's invalid. Um, but we also often, in smaller functions, you know, so we have several different kind of transformations, for example. We can um, do a Spark SQL transform. We can load some data into a database. We can um, load some data into a Hive database. Um, and, and we have some polymorphism that kind of splits out the implementation of those different kinds of transforms. And those often kind of validate their own little piece of the input with their own little piece of the spec, just to make sure that it's OK. Um, they don't really need to, because it's already been validated. but we call those methods directly in a lot of test scenarios. Um, and it kind of gives us a really nice future proofing against like 
what if we restructure this in the future and they're now getting unvalidated input in some interesting way? Um, that just kind of makes me not have to worry about that because I can, at every level, I can be calling those subcomponents to validate that this thing is the thing I expect it to be. Um, and, and for a developer coming into that code, it makes it really clear what is supposed to be coming into this method. Um, so um, there's a lot of polymorphism going on. As I mentioned, there's several different transform types. We can read data from a couple different places. Um, a, a goal of the system is not to support like every kind of database and every kind of source and sync you could possibly imagine. We want to pick a few operations and support them really well. Um, so our, our primary goal is to kind of consume this big fire hose um, and do something useful to it and, and produce like Hive tables and Postgres tables. Um, that, that's kind of our primary objective to do, if we, if we can do that really well, um, then if we can, you know, if, if we develop a really obvious need for some like, oh, we really want to be able to put stuff in an index or in some kind of other data store, we can get around to implementing that well. But if we can do this really well, we can support hundreds and hundreds of tables, um, and that'll meet most people's needs most of the time. Um, so we don't need like this kind of unlimited extensibility that's really fast and really easy. Um, but, but we need, as, as maintainers of this system, we need the ability to add stuff on. Um, so I think in general we were well served by Clojure's polymorphism, but um, for a new developer coming into our system, it's not entirely obvious um, what you need to do to make kind of a thing happen. You want to implement a new transform type. It means you need to um, extend some of the multis that are used for the spec. You need to extend some other multi that's used to actually execute the transform. Um, you need to extend a couple records in a couple places to um, describe those data frames as they move throughout the system. So um, ultimately, not hard, pretty nice, pretty expressive, but I mean, it does let you kind of pick and choose, but it can be difficult to kind of know where you need to go and navigate around that system. Um, and th I think this is kind of related to, to, I have this little note here in the bottom right corner that says, oh, I'd be neat if someone could you know, generate this diagram for me automatically. Um, I think this also relates to the, the, the sort of problem of this blurred line between the structural description that spec provides and the sort of validation and selection predicates that it provides. Um, because a computer parsing that spec, it's not going to be obvious like how to represent a predicate necessarily, especially if it's like a custom written predicate. You know, how do you represent the predicate that says this must be a DAG um, in like a diagram like this? And how do you like, I, it's hard for me to generate documentation from the spec itself that would guide a developer to understanding it very well. Um, so testing. Um, testing is critical for us because as I mentioned, we've got hundreds of tables. Um, most tables are compositions of potentially dozens of other tables. Um, and by the time you get to the final product, you might have dozens of SQL queries um, that, that do lots of stuff, and they do lots of interesting side effects. And um, our old ETL system was really not tested, I think. Um, we have some kind of monitoring, but we don't have any way to say, hey, if I change this piece of data, would that break something? It's like, I don't know, I can like, you know, do an archaeology expedition through 100 different Python files and like look at the Spark API calls and consult the stars and see if I think that that might make it break. Ultimately, it's going to blow up in the middle of the night and then we're going to have to fix it in a hurry. Um, and and I, I have heard and made a lot of excuses for why we didn't test this, like, well, SQL is declarative, like, you don't really need to test it, or like, um, you're just moving data from this database to that one, or like, that's so simple. Um, but it's so easy to drop the ball when you're doing plumbing. If you misspell a column name, it disappears and dashboard's blown up and like, oops, now you sent 10,000 bad sales reports to all your customers. And um, so I think all of those excuses are wrong. Um, here's a real SQL query from our system. And you know, it's like SQL, it's so easy to understand. Anyone could tell what it does. Um, I think that that's a totally bad assumption that just because it's SQL or just because it's declarative or just because something, you don't need to test it. And, and I think ultimately what it boils down to is that testing this stuff is hard because testing Spark is hard. Testing these side effects are hard because they're, um, you know, Spark especially and, and the Hadoop ecosystem in general are very, they're, they're designed to be these like big complicated 
on-prem deployment things that have all kind of crazy mutating side effects and stuff. Um, but you really need to test them if you care about having data that is actually correct and actually means the thing that you said it means. Um, so handling these side effects in a test is, is difficult, and I think it's why we always avoided it because our, our old system, and I think a lot of systems, where, where the, the business logic of what the transformation is supposed to be doing is very tightly coupled with the plumbing of actually opening up a data source and writing data out. And if, if you look at the Spark API, it's immediately obvious, you know, they give you an example, and the example starts with like, read a data frame from S3, then do some stuff to it, and then write it. And it's just like all in a function, and like, who knows what you're doing in there. You might be reading other paths, you might be reading other databases, you might make calls in the middle that get other interesting external data. Um, so, you know, like mocking out all those things very carefully is like very time consuming to do over and over and over again. Um, so our approach to this is because we have this big giant declarative data structure, um, we have a SQL query, we have separately somewhere else, we have an S3 path that says this, you should load this data into a place and do this thing to it, and then you should do this SQL query to it, and then you should take the result of that and do this other SQL query to it, and this other thing, and then you should write it to this database. Um, the, the specification, the, the locality of the data, the, the JDBC URLs and the paths are all explicitly specified separately. And so we can go through this whole data structure and we can programmatically blow away all the locality and point it somewhere else. We can set up a fake Postgres database automatically. We can set up some fake folders in a file system somewhere automatically. Um, and then we just execute it. Um, we don't have a special test executor. We don't like have a totally different mode to run this. We just, when we run Spark and it writes Parquet files and we inspect those to see if they have the rows that people expected them to have. Um, and that has been, uh, and, and the other thing here that, that it's important is like a lot of these things that don't, uh, you know, appear to have obvious side effects might still do things to the data. Like when you load the data into a database, it might truncate the strings if they're specified wrong. And that is a data transformation there. You know, if it's really important that those strings be a thousand characters long because they have articles in them and they're getting chopped in half, they're getting mangled in a way that's wrong and, and your test, the only way, you can't simulate that and say, well, it's database load doesn't really change it. Yeah, it does change it. And, and the only way to test that like really safely is to like put it into a database and see what it does. Did you configure Postgres wrong and the UTF-8 characters got thrown away? Like, I don't know, you should load it into a database and find out. So um, we can give people really high fidelity feedback about exactly what is your data going to actually look like when this is actually executed. Um, so the kind of end result of all of this, um, this is a little, uh, it's a big graph that we generated. This is gen just programmatically generated from our data flow. Um, all of these little tiny boxes are transformations of some kind, either SQL queries or um, database loads. Um, our little team is able to make this run every night with very little effort. Um, we can pull in contributions from dozen different teams, and I think we've got like, I've got a number somewhere in here, I think we got like 30 developers have contributed to this already. Um, and this is just like in the past eight months, I would expect the size of this thing to double or triple over the next year. Um, and, and this is kind of a, a little tiny subset of that previous diagram, also programmatically generated. And I kind of wanted to illustrate here how I, in my opinion, how little you need to specify to make useful things happen. So, so this, is, this picture is kind of describing a workflow of a, uh, a job that, uh, a, a, a transform that takes change logs for events and it rolls them up into a table of the most recent change log for each event so you can know what the status of that thing is at any given time. Um, and, you know, on, on the front end, we describe what those things look like structurally and we put all the raw events into a table. And then we pull them back out of that table and we roll them up into another table that contains only the most recent event. And then we merge that because they didn't start logging change logs and they had some bugs where sometimes certain changes didn't get logged correctly. So we take that and we merge in another table that just has a seed value for every single account just in case there was no change log for that. Um, and then we publish that to another table. And, and these little snippets of Eden are the snippets that are used to render these boxes. So the box is just like a boxified format of those Eden snippets. There's not really a lot of magic going on there. Um, in terms of like increase in productivity from doing this, 
Um, our, our old system of these kind of bespoke Python scripts that had to be kind of manually validated every time, the only really way to validate them was to actually run them in prod. Um, in about four years, I think about 10 people committed to that repo, um, and we made about 200 data sets. And when I say data set here, I mean like um, a table that someone can actually use to do something. Um, and, and it took weeks to actually roll something out. This process takes several hours. It runs nightly. It runs every night, so you have to test it in between the time that it's running. Um, and when it blows up, you have to fix it. It's very expensive. Um, so um, taking this new approach, uh, we've been able to, in about eight months, pull in three times as many committers, um, build about three times more data sets per capita, um, and, and the time to roll out a new data set is, is dramatically reduced. Um, I think our CI pipeline is depressingly slow right now, but it takes about 45 minutes instead of like 12 hours. So it's a great, huge improvement. And, and we can run 30 of them at once. So in conclusion, um, you should use closure spec. Uh, I, I think it, there are some conceptual things about it that I don't totally love, but in terms of describing, concisely describing validation logic for data structures that are coming into your system, it is so incredibly useful. Um, and, and the composability of it um, makes it so I can you know, distribute that work among four different team members and, and pull it all together. And, and if I want to write a new thing that contains a data flow, I just reference that and it just works and it's great. Um, I think our implementation of some of the, the polymorphism inside the system is not necessarily ideal. Um, I think that's really just about being thoughtful about it and, and co-locating stuff where that makes sense. Um, and, and ultimately, I think you just have to document that really well about kind of translating human intent to like what structures do you actually need to implement. Um, you should also shut anyone up who tells you that they don't need to test their SQL queries because they're SQL queries. That's lazy, um, in my opinion. Um, and if you want to talk more about it, come talk to me about it. We are, no promises, I really want to open source it, but there's some work to be done there. So uh, let me know if you're interested because it'll help me make a case to my boss. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>